this is really what I want to talk about. Guns are not the issue. Guns have never been the issue and they will never be the issue. The real issue is mental health. There is a problem with mental health in the US. I'm a Canadian and we have a ton of guns in Canada, yet we don't see those type of shootings. We don't see this. There's one that happened at Polytechnic, I think 20 years ago, but we don't see those type of shootings in schools. We don't see those type of shootings in malls either. Why is that? What's the difference between the US and a country that's very close? We, we literally share the biggest border between two countries. Why is it that we are so close to each other? We are so similar to each other, but yet we don't see the same type of problem. This is the Nico Lagan Show. Warning. Warning. This show contains explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Real. Real. Raw. Raw. And shooting you straight. This is the Nico Lagan Show. And now your host, Nico. Awesome. So are guns really the issue or is it something else? Are we blaming guns just because it's easy? because we don't want to face the reality that the problem is a lot bigger than what we believe it is. And this is exactly what I want to talk. Haha, <laughs> sorry for the guys on the stream. I'm just running the intro. So for the guys on Instagram, give me one second. The stream is just going. And absolutely, hey, John, absolutely, let me know. Oh, we, here we go. Here we go, and we are live. So, I haven't even started yet. And John, J, uh, JG, love to put a word. Write something down, brother, and I will read it to everybody, and I will answer your question. This is the whole point of having those lives. I want to interact with anybody that has a question. So, first and foremost, if you guys have questions you want, to pick my brain or you disagree with what I'm saying, please let me know. This is why I'm here. But today I want to start by saying this. I'm not here to talk about the shooting that happened last, uh, last weekend. I don't want to talk about the shooter. I don't want to give him any more news that what he's already getting, because I think that as a society, we need to stop giving them the attention that they want, because that's exactly why they do it. Those fucking cowards want the attention and that's why they do what they do so i will not name his name today i will not talk about the shooting if this is what you're expecting today i encourage you to go to see a, another news outlet they're all talking about it so you can easily go somewhere else what i want to really talk about today is what do we have to learn from this because there is something to learn like we we have to stop blaming what we believe the problem is and start looking in the mirror and admitting that we are the problem. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. So please, anybody that has an opinion, doesn't matter that it's on the stream. It doesn't matter that it's on Instagram. Anybody that has an opinion, please, please let me know. On that note, again, I'm not speaking about the shooter today. I will not name his name. And... Yeah, it's despicable the people that are taking advantage of this out, out there. So I fucking no, no, and hell no. But what I want to get into this is, let me start by giving you some statistics about the Longhorn State. Let's talk about Texas for a second. So 36% of Texans have or possess a firearm. 42% of them or 44% of them have a gun in the house. So they might not possess the gun, but they have a house that has a gun in it. Between 2000 and 2016, as per uh, Gallup's data, we're talking about a 6% drop. So there is less guns per capita in Texas than 16 years ago. FYI. Also, another statistic that I found very interesting is that you look at blue states like Oregon and Vermont, they have a higher gun per household than Texas. This is not something we talk about very often, but this is the case. This is the exact situation right now. And anybody of you, if you want to know where I get my statistics from, I will put them at the bottom of the feed once it's published or when you look at the, the podcast, it's going to be there as well. All of my sources will be listed for you to consult them. And one of the things that I found very interesting that I found that I found this morning about Texas is that, you know, 
a lot of the things that people complain about Texas about is the fact that they have a lot of firearms that are stolen. They're a massive country. I think they're the biggest, their second biggest state in the US when it comes to population. And they do have a lot of guns per capita. And a lot of people are complaining about guns being stolen. What I found surprising is that if you look at the amount of gun per capita and you also look at the population that they have and you also look about the you look at the statistics of guns that are recovered used in a crime meaning that if a gun was stolen and then the person that stole it used it in a crime they all middle of the pack like there's so many more states that are ahead of them on all those categories and do you know which state has the most recovered stolen gun after a crime the district of columbia how funny is that? How funny that the people that are always complaining about guns, they all work in a place that has the highest rate of stolen gun recovered after a crime. And I was looking at, I was actually looking at the statistics for this and especially the voting statistics. And we are talking about a state that's been through the 2020 election, 92.2% of people in the District of Columbia voted for Biden. 90, 90%, 91% in 2016. 2012, it's 91%. 2008, it's 92 So you get the idea. This is a predominantly blue state, just like Oregon is, just like um, Vermont is. But yet, we don't talk about those states. We always blame the red state, the south states, for them being the problem. So I thought it was interesting. It has not really something to do with what I wanted to talk about today, but I, I want to address some misconceptions. And those were a couple of them I wanted to address. And there's another one. There's one massive mis misconception that the north side of the U.S. have when it comes to the south, if you look at the south portion of the U.S. So one of the biggest misconceptions is that somebody with money can simply walk into a gun store in Texas and purchase a gun that same day and leave with it like that. There, there's nothing else to it. As long as I have money, I can buy a gun in Texas. Wrong. This is simply not true. There is a background check that has to be done when it comes to purchasing a gun, even in Texas. So I wanted to take the time today and I wanted to take the opportunity, should I say, to go through the procedure, to speak about what is required. So if you are a law abiding citizen, what are the steps that you need to go through in order to procure yourself a legal firearm? First and foremost, if you show up to a gun store, you'll need identification. Obviously, I think that makes sense, right? Um, you'll need something government issued like a driver's license, for example. Now, once they identified who you are, they know who they're talking to, they will require what we call an ATF form 4473, which... The 4473 form is what the ATF will look at in order to see if you are a felon, if you are legally allowed to possess the firearm. And before we go any further, I want to specify this, that there is, there is consequences to lying on one of those forms. And you're talking about up to 10 years in federal prison. So just so you know, people that are caught lying on the government form like the 4473, could face up to 10 years in a federal prison. FYI. Now, if you are, the only time you do not have to fill out the ATF form or a background check is if you possess already what we call a, an LTC, which is a license to carry, which is a permit that you need to apply to in Texas. So if they already identified you as somebody that is safe, that's somebody that can buy a firearm, you don't need to go through the 4473 as well as the background check. FYI. If you are just a regular guy that's never had a firearm before or you do not possess an LTC, you will need to go through a background check. This is something that you have to do in person. It is something that when you are at the store itself, the person the, the person working there, the entity working there, however, will run a background check. They basically contact the National Instant Background Check System in order to make sure that you were not flagged as an individual that cannot possess the firearm. This is something that takes a few minutes. So if you are a law abiding citizen that meets the criteria of owning a firearms and a firearm in Texas, you are capable of purchasing one and leaving with it that same day. Texas does not have a whole time on the, the background check. It's, it's something that's done right then and there. So 
to recap a bit, to make it very simple, one, you need to prove identity. So you need to have proof of identification, something that's government issued. If you do not possess an LTC, you will need to, to file a 4473, which is an ATF form. You will also have to do a background check. So first and foremost, that is a misconception I think that we address right now. But this is the procedure in Texas in order to possess a gun. Now, let's talk about the problematic prior to what happened last weekend. I said I wouldn't talk about the event itself and I will not talk about it, but we all know what I'm talking about right now, right? I don't need to specify anything, but there are some things that happened that they're not necessarily talking in the news right now and this bothers me because we're using such a cop-out by saying that firearms are the problem when firearms are just a tool. They're just a tool to accomplish something just like a car is, just like a hammer is, just like anything out there is. That being said, what happened last weekend? How was a guy like that capable of putting his hands on a firearm and do what he did? There was pro there First, he lied on a government form. So the 4473 has a portion of it that stipulates that have or that asks the question, and it, this is the, the question G, out of the 4473 asks the following question. Have you ever been discharged from the armed forces under dishonorable conditions? Turns out that in 2009, he was discharged from the military because they had concerns about his mental health. This is problematic because we have a procedure, a government procedure that is supposed to help prevent these types of situation and yet he was able to lie on it the second problem that we have to talk about regarding last week is that when you are dismissed or discharged should i say from the military especially dishonorably like if you're you're doing it with honor obviously it's all fucking good there's no problems there but if you are discharged dishonorably there is a military procedure that requires your name to be put on a national list band. And this prevents you from owning a firearm. This is what the background check is all about. That background check will identify, if you were identified as somebody that cannot possess a firearm because you were dishonorably discharged from the military, the background check will identify you it will identify you as somebody that cannot own a firearm. So we have two massive problems here. One, the person lied on a government form. He said that he was never discharged from the army from dishonorable discharge, which is wrong. It's true. Google it. And again, I'll put my sources in there. But he was dismissed. Never identified on the form. Uh, sorry, lied on the form, but was never put on the national list banning him from owning a firearm. So those are two major problems. And, you know, this is one of the things that I, I'm not a fan of when it comes to Democrat politics, that putting red tape upon red tape upon red tape upon red tape for to prevent law-abiding citizens from getting firearms. Because at the end of the day, that's all it does. A criminal will always find a way to obtain something illegally. They don't care about the legal procedure. That's why they're fucking criminal. They don't care about the law. That's why they're fucking criminal. So all that red tape, all those procedures that mostly Democrat people want to put in place never really prevent criminal from obtaining firearms because they don't do it legally. You can see that it's that simple as lying into the form. And for somebody, for a worker at the U.S. military, from not doing his jobs and pow, you got a guy that should not have a firearm that has a firearm obtained through legal channel because he didn't do it legally. Don't believe what the media outlet is saying out there. He did not do it legally because he fucking lied on the form, which makes it illegal. And as I said before, you could be facing 10 years of federal prison for lying on the government form. So let's stop fucking lying to people and say that his gun was obtained legally. He fucking lied. We have somebody, we have an employee at the U.S. Department, uh, the U.S. military that was incompetent, that didn't do his job. And then you have somebody that lied on a form. 
Sounds good. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does because it's ludicrous to say that his gun was obtained legally when clearly it was illegally obtained. Now, this is the problem I really want to talk about. And allow me to take a sip of my tea here because I won't stop. My mouth is dry as hell. This is really what I want to talk about. Guns are not the issue. Guns have never been the issue and they will never be the issue. The real issue is mental health. There is a problem with mental health in the U.S. I'm a Canadian and we have a shit ton of guns in Canada. Although right now our buffoon of a prime minister is preventing everybody from doing anything with their firearms except criminals. But the point of the matter is that in Canada, we have a shit ton of guns. Yet we don't see those type of shootings. We don't see this. There's one that happened at Polytechnic, I think, 20 years ago. But we don't see those type of shootings in schools. We don't see those type of shootings in malls either. Why is that? What's the difference between the U.S. and a country that's very fucking close? We, we literally share the biggest border between two countries. The biggest land border between two countries are shared between Canada and the U.S. Why is it that we are so close to each other, we are so similar to each other, but yet we don't see the same type of problem? Yet we have a massive amount of guns in Canada. Those are the questions that are worth addressing. And hopefully my next portion can start to give you an idea of what I believe are the issues. And don't think that I have all the answers because I do have an idea. I do think I know what we can do to make this better. But this is a long-term solution. Like any big problems that we have, it will always take time to fix it because this is something that's been at work for a very long time our society is sick there is something wrong in society today we have no values we don't have any strong values we don't believe in our virtues we don't take responsibilities for our action and it's time that we need to stop it's time that we stop doing that it's time that we grow a fucking pair of the, a, a fucking pair of balls and we just simply look at ourselves in the mirror and start addressing the fact that we are the fucking problem a gun is a tool just like a hammer is just like a car is this is not what the problem is it's lazy for us to fucking blame guns when the problem is clearly us and here is what i mean so asper nij.ojp.gov.gov Suicide, suicide tendencies were found to be a strong predicator of perpetrating mass shooting. Of all the shooters in the Violence Project database, 30% were suicidal prior to the shooting. 69% were suicidal during the shooting. If you look at K-12 students, the rate of suicidal tendencies jumped to 92%. In college and university students, 100% of them were suicidal at the time of the shooting. Where are they talking about this in the news? Nowhere. They don't talk about this. They don't want to talk about the fact that we have a mental health issue. They do everything that they fucking can not to blame health, to blame fucking guns because they want to disarm the population. Let's not lie to each other here. This is the goal. The goal is to have a population that does not have guns. Look at what's fucking going on in Canada and you have the proof right there. So we're talking about 30% prior to the shooting. We're talking about the adults. 69% during the shooting. In K-12 students, 92% of them were suicidal. And 100% of college slats, university students were suicidal at the time that they committed a mass suicide, a mass uh, shooting. Also, something worth mentioning: when you look at past trauma, thirty-one percent of people who did a mass shooting were found to have experienced severe childhood trauma, and eighty percent of them were considered in crisis. Let let that sink in for a second. Most of them are suicidal. And 80% of them were considered to be in some type of crisis. So how is it possible that we don't see this coming? How is it fucking possible that there is no warning signs about this? Or is it that we're not just simply paying fucking attention? Is it that, once again, we don't take the responsibility to say that, yes, there were warning signs, but we didn't act on them? 
Because surprise, motherfucking surprise, as per the Violence Project database, it seems that 48% of shooters, of mass shooters, divulged their plans in advance to others. 48% informed either a family member, a friend, a colleague, even a stranger, or even fucking law enforcement, almost 50% of them spoke about what they they were planning about doing. But yet nobody fucking stopped them. 50 fucking percent, one out of two, spoke about what they were planning about doing. And somehow, nobody fucking stopped them. Nobody does anything about this. We need to own this shit. We need to take responsibility for this shit because this is our fault. This is our fucking fault. And 50 fucking percent of them could have been prevented. Let's look at more statistics, because this is not enough, right? Let's, let's fucking dig into this shit even more, because it gets worse. 64.5% of mass shooters had a criminal record. 63% of them had a history of violence. And 27%, 28% of them had domestic violence. So we're talking about half of the people spoke about the fact that they were going to do something horrific. 65% of them had a history of violence. 69% of them were suicidal, depending if on the age. 69%. Then you had 92% for K-12 students and 100% of students. How is that not... How could we not predict this? The numbers are right fucking there. And again, if you don't believe in my numbers, because those fucking numbers are not shared anywhere, you're not going to see that on TV. They're not going to talk about this in the news outlet. The numbers, I will provide you the source so you can go check them out yourself. Because this is ludicrous and this needs to stop. We need to stop blaming an object for causing this shit. This is not what's doing this. The numbers are right there. And you know what? Again, it gets fucking worse. So what about the narrative that we're hearing right now that antidepressant or SSRIs are correlated to mass shooters? Because we talk because I know if you're more conservative or you're libertarian, you watch different news than just CBC and um, and CNN. Antidepressant and SSRIs are starting to be linked to mass murder. They're starting to find a cor a correlation between the two. And I found an article, I found actually it's a study. It was made by co-founder of the national nonprofit organization, Abel Child, Sheila Matthews. She found in her study that nine out of 10 mass shooters were on subtype of psychiatric drug with violent side effect. 90% as per her study. And again, look at the comments below, look at the description of this video. I will provide those studies. 9 out of 10. Yet, when I always have to play devil's advocate, right? So I went to see on the other side, what does the FDA say about this? Because Sheila Matthews says that 90% of those cool shooters or those shooters were on some type of antidepressant. As per the FDA, and I quote, antidepressant have been linked to higher rates of suicide risk among young people, but experts say that there's no evidence to suggest that there is an increase in violence or homicidal urges. Okay, you know what? Sure, L let's assume that they're right. Let's assume that Sheila Matthews is full of shit and she doesn't know what she's talking about and that the organization FDA is right. They're saying that there's no correlation between SSRIs and violent behaviors. But there is, as per their saying, there is a correlation between SSRIs and suicidal thoughts. What did I say about suicidal thoughts? 100% of college and university students that were mass shooters had suicidal, had suicidal tendencies. 92% in K-12 and 69% in the rest. How is there not a correlation between the two? They're clearly stating that there is a correlation between SSRIs and suicidal behavior, and we clearly, I, I think I clearly showed you 
that there is a correlation between suicidal tendencies and mass shooters. So again, it's time that we stop fucking ignore, like, ignoring this because this is never spoken about. People that spoke about, that speaks about this are, are called to be conspiracy theorists or to go against the establishment. But th the proof is right there. It is right fucking there. There is a correlation. So instead of blaming firearms, can we address what the real problem might be? Because one of the statistics that is fucking scary is the fact that 96% of mass shooters are men and are men that acted alone. 96% of them. Is it possible that school shootings or just mass shooters are just a symptom of a bigger problem that there is an elephant in the room that we're not addressing that we don't dare to speak about. Is that possible? Is it possible that this is the issue and we need to own to this shit? And I tell you that the answer is yes. And what do I think that the problem is? Well, let me fucking tell you what it is. I will ask you a question. Is it possible that school shooting or just a, school shooters is it possible that school shooters are just a side effect of the lack of masculine men in the household? Is it possible that young men need guidance? They need mentorship. They need to have strong male figures in their life to teach them what it is to be a man. Is it possible that all those young men need or needed was a good man to be present? to teach them what it is to be or to become a good man? Is that possible? I believe that it is. I believe that this is the actual issue. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, depending on your age, even former President George W. Bush addressed this when he was still in office. Over the past few decades, over the past four decades, fatherlessness has emerged as one of the greatest societal problems. We know that children who grew up with absent fathers can suffer lasting damage. They are more likely to end up in poverty or drop out of school, become addicted to drugs, have a child out of wedlock, or end up in prisons. Fatherlessness is not only... The, the, not only does the lack of fathers cause all of the things mentioned above, but one of the... This is one of the biggest problems. It is the biggest problem that society is facing right now is the fact that boys are growing up without fathers. They're growing up being raised by single mothers. And a single mother cannot teach a boy how to become a man. I don't give a fuck what people say out there. A woman cannot teach a man, a boy how to become a man. Let's, let's, let me repeat this again. A mother cannot teach her son how to become a man in the same way that a father cannot teach his daughter how to become a woman. This is why it's so important for us, for men to have mentors. Because think about it, if, if almost every single mass shooters out there was suicidal, think about this one. Men are purpose driven. Men need purpose in their life. We need something to wake up in the morning. There is something that we need in our life to make sure that our life is worth fucking living. Why are we on this planet if we do not have a reason to live? How can somebody not be suicidal if they have no reasons to live? Have you ever heard of somebody that wanted to commit suicide when they had purpose? Have you ever heard of somebody that was depressed because they had all the purpose in the world because they knew exactly what they were supposed to do because they had a meaningful life? It's never going to happen. So why are we not talking about this? Why are we not trying to bring back purpose to men's life, to boys' life, to bring back masculine men into the life of our youth. Because I'm telling you, all that we're seeing right now are side effects. We need to address the root problem. We need to bring men back in the family at the head of the table like it was supposed to be, like it's always been. This is what we're supposed to do and this is my goal. This is what I want to do. And holy shit, I just realized I've been babbling for half an hour now and you know, I want to finish with this. I want to congratulate the Allen Police Department officer that took that took down that gunman. I could not find his name. And if somebody out there knows 
what his name is, please let me know. I would love to reach out to him personally and just thank him for what he did because it's because of strong men like him that this shit is going to stop. Because never forget that in order for evil to win, the only thing that good men need to do is nothing. So the only thing evil needs to win is for good men to do nothing. And that guy did what he had to do. So I want to congratulate him personally. Unfortunately, I don't know his name. But if you know, please let me know. Um, I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank every single one of you on the live, on the podcast, everywhere, whoever, all the people out there that support my content. I want to thank you. I want to thank every single one of you. I am extremely grateful because without you, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. So thank you very much for watching, for listening, for commenting, for liking. Make sure to go check out my, my website, nicolagan.com. My blog is there and I address a lot of the problems that I cannot talk on social media because they won't stop fucking banning my content. So if you want to really know what I'm talking about, what my real feelings are, unedited, uncensored, nicolagan.com. Go check out my blog. And again, thank you very much for being there. And until next time, remember this. The world has changed one man at a time. And it only takes one man to change the world. Peace out. You've been listening to The Nico Lagan Show. Nico has been involved in the martial arts for 20 years. He's a Muay Thai coach, focus coach, podcaster, and sought-after public speaker. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, find us on Facebook and Instagram at Coach Nico Lagan and on YouTube at The Nico Lagan Show. See you next time.